Maybe it's true. We all find ourselves in lives we didn't expect. But what I learned was... Powerful men don't have to be cruel. I got one guaranteed life. I was gonna live it. I had a plan. You said you would fall apart. Do you think that we got where we are by letting some inbreds muscle us? If that's who you think we are, you're making a fatal miscalculation. We're clerks and bankers and police officers, and we even got a judge. And if you're dim enough to fight us, I'm gonna rain bloody hell fire down on you and all you love. So you're threatening me with people who are more powerful than you? Exactly. So what am I talking to you for? Me. Hello, everyone. Congratulations on Live By Night. You're in some great movies this year. Live By Night, High Rise, a film that I was complimenting you on in the green room, uh, The Lost yes. City of Z, which is coming out next year, but yeah. has been finished for a, a little while. For a little while, yes. Uh, some fantastic films. How are you going about sort of choosing the films that you're in at this point? Because Foxcatcher before, you're American Sniper. Mm -hmm. You seem to be on kind of a roll here. I think it's a good, I mean, I wish that there was some strategy and formula, but I think it's just timing and luck and, and, and certainly I was really focused on working with great directors and, and really trying to kind of make that happen, irrespective of the size of the part. So Foxcatcher was a small role, but an amazing filmmaker. And that kind of like set off a whole domino effect of nice, big filmmakers. Was, was, was Foxcatcher a small part initially? I heard that, that like, you guys were, you shot a lot of stuff for that movie. Like, everybody shot a lot of stuff. And then everything kind of got figured out in the edit room over the course of, like, yeah, a, I mean, two I years. Yeah, I were like, there were, yeah, exactly. I mean, it was, uh, he shot maybe three different versions of a film. But it was never a huge part. Right. Um, but it was a great movie, yeah. yeah. So, Live by Night, Ben Affleck, written and directed, based on the Dennis Lehane uh, novel. It's his second time. I guess, collaborating, for lack of a better word, with Dennis Lehane after Gone Baby Gone. Had you read the book? Were you familiar with Dennis Lehane's work? I'd heard of Dennis Lehane, but I'd never read, I hadn't read this book. I think I'd read one of his other books. Um, but yeah, they've worked together before, and he's such a great author, and his books are so cinematic. I think Clint Eastwood's made one, Scorsese's made one, Ben's now made two. I think these books are just made to be movies. Um, and this era is such a cinematic era as well, the Prohibition era, Boston, mobsters. It's just perfect. It's like a dream. Your character is kind of a, a sort of a woman on the fringes a little bit, or I guess on the edge. You know, she's involved with cr with crime bosses and criminals, but she herself isn't isn't that much of a, a of a criminal. Uh, where did you find her? Because you're doing this particular accent. It's like Boston in the '30s. No, it's Irish. Irish. Oh, that's right. It is Irish. Excuse yeah. me. Sorry. But Irish plus great. Boston. <laughs> Let me walk this back. Irish plus Boston and in the '30s. Yeah, there's a little, there's a little bit of Boston, but but basically, thanks. It's like I'm the strongest so Irish accent you've ever heard, by the way. Although there are a lot of Irish people in Boston, to be fair. You just watched a massive interview fail. Excuse yeah, me. big yeah. one. <laughs> um, no, it was, yeah, I, what was the question? <laughs> uh, where did you find this character? What kind of research did you do? Okay, so in the book, it was she's really spelled out. She's an amazing character. She's like the daughter of an Irish, uh, daughter of a pimp, husband. Wait, I can't speak now. I'm totally thrown. Daughter of a pimp, but her uncle's a murderer. She grew up in a brothel. It's like a disaster. She didn't really stand a chance. So I knew I was coming at it from a place where she was very destructive and tortured and... Uh, and I think in that era, you know, she, she was like a gangster's mole. She was on the arm of a powerful man. But that was a survival mechanism. 
So there was no other way to rise and get out of her situation unless she kind of played that game and played that card. And I think she was just trying to survive every single day. You know, it was rough for her. What was it like uh, working with, with Ben? I mean, he's directing and acting. Had you worked with anyone that had done that yet? That would sort of do a scene with you and then run back to look at the monitor and then come back and... Yeah, I did, I did a film with Steve Buscemi, actually, just the two of us, a few years ago called Interview that he directed and, writ and had written and starred in. And it was, it, it was a similar thing, except with that, it was so... I mean, the budget difference was like $100 million, basically. That was like shooting a play and just the two of us in one room. And this was a massive, massive film. But Ben, he, you know, he not only wrote, produced, directed, you know, and starred in, he's, he's doing everything on this film. And I never once felt like... I had I, he wasn't present in a scene or that I didn't have a director. He's really able and capable of managing all sorts of different things. And obviously with Argo, he was incredibly successful at doing that. And he, he knows exactly what he's doing. It, it, in something like that, is collaborating with you at times, I would imagine if I were to do that, and I would never do that, but if I were to do that, I would, I would finish a scene and be like, how was I? Tell me how, was that I do, was it good? <laughs> I was just worried that like in the middle of a take, he'd be looking at me going, what are you doing? But he didn't. Um, or like looking at you, just like, like, like getting your, why'd you like, do that? Yeah, exactly. Like hearing your lines and wait. <laughs> <laughs> like mouthing them at you. What you no, he, um, no, he just was able to do it. I, I, he was totally in character in those moments. And then with technology, it's easy. You can just run back to the monitor. And, um, and it was great. And it was fun. And he's such a great guy. Have you spoken to him ever? No, I have not. I've heard he's humongous. Like he's in, first of all, he's a beast. He's like yeah. six foot five. He's an absolute tank of a man. Kenneth Lonergan was in the green room a couple weeks ago for Manchester by the Sea. Yeah. And for whatever reason, all he wanted to talk to me about was the time he met Ben Affleck and how big he was. Yeah, I was amazed at how big he was too. I was like, oh yeah, I've heard he's quite big. He goes, no, 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 no. He's huge. He's humongous. <laughs> it's hard to get over I mean, him. He's not that big. He's also Batman. Do you know what I, yes. mean? I mean? He shouldn't be small. Um, but no, but that, yeah. Michael his, Keaton was Batman. Is he small? <laughs> he's kind of small. Okay. small. But that was then, that was then. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yes, now Batman must be a giant. What are we talking about? I can't remember. We're that. just going tangential. Okay, yeah. Ben's really tall and really talented and clever and fun. So the vibe on the set is just like, it was great. I, and that really does trickle down from the top. There are different, in my experience, really different types of directors and and Ben really reminded me of Clint Eastwood. I mean, the same kind of very relaxed, very trusting, very empathetic approach to directing and, and understanding what it is to be an actor, which is just, you know, a pit of neurosis, basically. And having someone who can just, like, allow you to find the space and time to feel out what you're doing and be patient with that and understand that it's, it's difficult. It, it's complex to go through those things publicly. It's so interesting that, that you bring that up because I think so often people don't understand that pit of neurosis that actors have, that for everything you see them doing on screen, a good actor is asking why they're doing that. A good actor is going through those, mo not motions, but doing those scenes being like, why does my character do this? Why should I be doing this? Because everything needs a reason for an action. And if you're, a lot of times you need your director to explain that to you. Yeah, or you want to figure it out with someone or have the space. And I, you know, I've done films... I did a film when I was younger and it was like a, it was a, a big action film. And it just wasn't about examining character. And I, for me, that really is the most interesting part is figuring it out and why are people behaving this way and, and without sounding too pretentious, although every time we talk about acting, it sounds pretentious, but... It's so but, unfortunate. But the psychology of someone, I know, you just sound like a complete I, something. I, I know, I, I, and, I, and most actors feel that way, and, and, I, and that's so humble and I think smart to feel that way, but it's so unfortunate because acting, for those who are good at, at it and care about it, it is about observing behavior and feeling behaviors out and really thinking about them, and every performance is kind of an essay on different kinds of behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and studying people. I mean, you, it's, it's a weird, it is a strange job, but it does, and it takes an awful lot. And to get to those places of, there was a day in this where I had to basically cry from whatever, 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. at night. But like on other people's coverage, it, to keep that going, like it, not that it's hard, but it's, it does take something out of you. It's not just like, anyway, I don't know where we're going with this. Is that the really is, hard? Is, is that the um, the the wonderful shot that that pushes in on you and there's a, the the tear? I guess so. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen the film no. yet. Well, you're uh, wonderful in it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Um, what has been the hardest role that you that you think that you've had as an actress? The role that was toughest for you to wrap your head around and to really understand, you know, what you were doing as that character. 
Um, I don't know. It's it's a funny. I guess maybe doing some theatre can be really really challenging. But it's it's an odd profession because in a way, the more the harder it is, the more satisfying it is, and that's where the, it can be slightly torturous. I think if I'm not challenged and it's not grueling, it doesn't. It's not sating in some way. Um, like that action movie that you did that didn't require that was not, much. But yeah, that was not so good. Yeah, and that, I, that was yeah. That becomes difficult because you're being told to do something and there's no reason for it. It's just for the sake of, I don't know, showcasing. I think it was what it was, which was like a big popcorn movie. And and for me, I I don't really see those films. I'd never, you know, it was at a moment where. I think you know there's a strategy to this industry where you have to think about how you get your numbers up or foreign value or all this stuff. And I was like, I could just pop in and be a villain in a in a in a movie. And I and they cast me without meeting me. But the first thing that was said when I arrived, the director to me was like, God, you're really short. And I was like, Yeah. I mean, there's just basically nothing. <laughs> there's nothing villainous about me whatsoever. Like I couldn't fire the gun without closing my eyes, because I was frightened of, the, I mean, it was pathetic. So I had to have this, I wore these glasses, and every time I shot the gun, I had to push a button, and they'd turn into sunglasses, so I could be like that. Wait, um, we're getting close, which, can I ask what movie? G.I. Joe. Oh, G.I. Joe. Yes. <laughs> a long time ago now. I unfortunately have not seen uh, G.I. Joe, but. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was a while ago, and it was fun, and I made great friends, but, you know, it, I guess that was hard, because I just felt so out of my comfort zone. I like sitting in a corner kind of really digging into something and really figuring out character and, and, and approaching it from that. And that was just not about, it wasn't that kind of film. You said that Clint Eastwood was, uh, like Ben Affleck, is an extremely sensitive and, and, and smart director, which I, I've heard he is as well. But I've also heard Eight Hour Days and like no more than one or two takes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a holiday. A Clint Eastwood film is a holiday. And you also, but you also feel like you're in good hands. And he made a hugely, American Cyber was a hugely successful film. And there's no way that, it's, it's still astounding to me that we managed to make that film having that much fun and it being that that little conflict. But um, It's the only dramatic film to, I think, be the number one box, domestic box office earner in a year. Yes. As far, I, mean, I mean, maybe since like 19, since like Ordinary People or something. <laughs> but like since the, the box office has generally been dominated by superhero movies and yeah. comic book movies, I think it's the first... R-rated drama. R-rated so. hu movie about humans. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for real live humans as well. Um, no, he just, he just does it with ease. And, and it was a perfect storm. I think the timing of that film was everything kind of aligned for it to work but he does he does make it very easy and the trickle down effect of that the crew are happy the sets relaxed um what about you when you ask for like a, an extra take or like you're you're having you're trying to figure something out and it doesn't feel like it's there for you yet but i can keep going and going and going i don't know that i ever feel like yes i've nailed it i i, I do get moments where i feel like i've given an, an immense amount but i but I know from doing a lot of theatre that the more you work something, the better it gets. And that, you know, a play, a run of a play can be three, four months. What it begins as and what it ends as is so vastly different. And I still wake up to this day thinking about plays that I've done and like, oh, that's it. That's what I should have done. You know, it's, it's really bottomless when you're breaking down the psychology of people. It's, it's just like there's no limit. So I can keep going and going and going. It's good to work with someone who's a little bit more relaxed. It's like, it's okay, we've got it. And I'm like, <laughs> but actually, yeah, yeah. But we only did one take. It's like, it's great. But you know, with Clint, on? that was hell. I mean, at first, that was hell. I remember really? the first day, my first scene on a Clint Eastwood movie, and it was mass. I mean, I was so, I was so overwhelmed that I got this part. And so, and there's Bradley Cooper, and it was all, it was a beautiful scene. And anyway, I turned up, and we did this moment where he flies back, and we meet on the tarmac, and I'm pregnant, and... It's this moment of like recognition and reconnection and we did it once and I was like, okay, first take kind of done. And then Clint was like, see you tomorrow. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, no, because we couldn't, he was like, I was like, can we not? And he was like, you cast the right people. And he walked off set and I was like, ah! <laughs> and then once he surrendered to that, like, okay, it's Clint Eastwood. He knows more than I do. So but I have to ask, what about the, the baby, though, in American Sniper. The Did baby. you have moments where you were like, but Clint, the, the baby doesn't... The baby was... The baby was... This, it was hysterically funny, the baby. <laughs> if anyone remembers, in That's American... Yeah, yeah, yeah. In American Sniper, the, the baby that is her and Bradley Cooper's character has a scene that looks... 
for lack of a better words or more respectful words, remarkably fake. <laughs> <laughs> because it was. <laughs> it was like, Clint's like children and animals. No, no, no. That's what I, not. that's exactly why I thought he didn't do it. He was just like, I'm not he's having like, a baby He's like, set. I'm 85 years old. I don't want a screaming kid. No, there was, there was a real baby in a shop, but I don't know what, because also this baby, first of all, it was ugly. It was like a, it was a very realistic fake baby. And it could move. And for some reason, they didn't use the remote control. So Brady like, wiggles the arm at one point, and this thing does this. <laughs> and I was trying to look at it and, like, cry, I think. But well, when I first was in the hospital giving birth to the baby, and they brought it over, Bradley whispered, that thing is ugly, in my ear on the first take. And I was, like, <clears throat> crying. And there's a moment where we really giggle. It was, I don't know why. That was a shame. Well, wasn't that also a scene, I think, in that film where... The scene where it's particularly clear about the baby is one, the one where Bradley is sort of being forceful with it and having an argument around you with the baby, if I remember That's correctly. That's when he wiggles the arm, yeah. Which would have been so much harder to actually do with a, a real baby. It actually yeah. does probably a child some well, I had to pretend to breastfeed it. Imagine how that felt. Like. It was just, the whole thing was really weird, but anyway... Cast the right the people. Cast the right people. <laughs> I want to talk to you about this this film that's coming out next year uh, that I got the chance to see at the New York Film Festival. It's by one of my favorite filmmakers, James Gray. He did We Own the Night, um, Two Lovers, Little Odessa, and um, The Yards. Great, great, great films. Yeah. Uh, and his new film that you are in, arguably I would say the star of by the end of the film, is maybe his best film. It's incredible. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. What was it like working with him on this on this movie? We shot the whole thing in Belfast. It's a story of the guy that was sent to map the Amazon at the turn of the 20th century, a man called Colonel Percy Fawcett. So really, this territory was kind of uncharted, and he mapped it and discovered indigenous people and that journey. I was, again, the wife, <laughs> left at home with the children. But we really... But I would argue... It yes, it's not just... Sorry, that's not to be derogatory, but it could, it could have been that way, and James is such an amazing and sensitive filmmaker that we fought to really find this woman's story in. And I feel like it's a very feminist performance in lots of ways. Can I say, when I saw the film, what I, lo what I loved about this was that it starts with you as the wife, and I feel like you're a wonderful actress, and as you kind of said it in your tone, I've seen you cast as that a couple of times, and it was so wonderful to see that that character became so much more than that in the story that I almost like stood up and cheered, not just for the character, but for Sienna Miller, the actress. Oh, I always felt like, thank you. Give, C give her her due. Like, <laughs> That's so yeah. Right. It was nice to see someone actually like give you this part to chew on. You know? that's so that's so that's it's literally ex everything that he said he was going to do. So I feel really like he did right by me in that, and hugely proud to be in this film. That's it's like a beautiful, beautiful thing that he's made, and with no budget, you know, was in five no weeks he shot all on film. They go to Colombia, and it's Charlie Hunnam and Robert Pattinson and all sorts of other amazing people. Pattinson in it. is unbelievable. Pattinson's in amazing in it, and they all got super thin and were sort of dying in the jungle. But James was shooting on film, flying reels out of Colombian jungle via Miami to London to be processed. I mean, he's... I an they lost reels at times. They lost one reel, yeah. That's unbelievable. And one got damaged, of course it did. But he's, he's the real deal. He's a really authentic, amazing filmmaker. And it feels like those great movies of the 70s. It, yes. In moments, it feels like Visconti. It's, like, it's the most gorgeous thing. Darius Conji shot it, who is no fool. I mean, Bob Richardson shot this. He's also a genius. So, and this looks beautiful as well. Yeah. The, the the production design and the cinematography in this. I know is Jess Gonshaw, who did good. Foxcatcher as well. Actually, the most amazing production designer. Are yeah. you, do you find yourself working consistently with the the same people? I mean, outside of just the director, but these direct the caliber of directors that you're working with generally are hiring like the highest caliber of DPs and yeah. production designers. Well, they all talk to each other. I mean, Jess, I really think is the best in the world, and he did. Foxcatcher and this, um, you, there are there are like five of the top people, and they and they do tend to kind of move around. I think all of the best directors talk to each other and share tips, and certainly with casting as well. And I think that's the knock on effect. When I got Foxcatcher, then I got American Sniper. Clint had spoken to Bennett, and you know it, it goes on and on and on. And having that support and being able to do a film and be someone who's easy to work with and works hard, I think you know that's there's 
people talk to each other, basically. That helps. Is it hard? I, I, I'm always fascinated by this because they, actors always want to be easy to work with because that's how you sort of get a reputation to get the next job. But I find that it's difficult to be easy to work with sometimes as an actor because as an actor, it's your job to question the motives of your character and why you would do something and sort of pose questions as to where the camera is, how am I supposed to do this, and that can take time and you have to be very aware of how you are perceived while asking those questions. I think with a good director, that's not, I mean, I've never, I've never paid attention to what lens are we shooting on, therefore I'm gonna moderate my performance. I don't work in that kind of craft way. I really do trust once I'm on a set, the filmmaker that I've decided to work with and understand that it's their vehicle and I am there to kind of tell their story as best as possible. That's not to say that I'm a pushover and I definitely push back and James and I, James Gray and I, are great friends but it was the first time I really butted heads because I don't know why I think that was kind of the character and I think that tends to creep in but we really I really we did kind of go at each other a bit and laugh about it but it was much more of a struggle than I've ever had and in a way that was creatively really liberating I think I trust myself more now than I did but with someone like Ben or Clint they let you they let you run there's it's very much it's, it's much more of a creative sort of freedom, which sometimes I get scared about. I want to be, I want to have the conflict, but... Um, what about a filmmaker like uh, Ben Wheatley in High Rise, who you were here for, uh, another wonderful film this year. Now, if you talk about someone like Clint Eastwood, Ben Affleck, James Gray, these are directors with a, you know, a resume, uh, a sort of stellar, incredible resume, resume. And I would argue that Ben's is that as well, but they're much smaller films. They're cultish in, in, in many ways. What gave you the confidence to work with him on High Rise, which is a very daring project Mad altogether? Film, yeah. yeah. I, I love Ben's work. I think in England, he's probably the most exciting emerging filmmaker. And I've always loved to balance independent cinema films. That, that's the kind of movie that I love to watch. I mean, I think he's, he's a genius. And it was something that I could go and do and be with a group of fantastic English actors and and be part of that kind of maverick, independent British cinema, which is which is a type of cinema that I really want to support and love watching. Absolutely. Let's uh, uh, see if the audience has any questions. Hi, my name is Paula Etienne. Thank you for coming out today. Um, I just wanted to know your thought process in choosing roles now versus in the past and how you actually dive into that psychological process of getting into a character. I don't know that there's any difference in the way that I choose them. I kind of focus on director and I'm happy to go and like make the tea on a great director's set just to be around that kind of brilliance. And the, and the psychological, I think as you get older and I'm a mother now, I think I have a deeper understanding of what it is to be human. I think I'm more curious in ways where I was maybe more frivolous when I was younger and I could just kind of pop in and just like explode. Now I really want to dig and explore. So I'll, with this character, Emma Gould, I, I sort of studied Irish immigrants in, the, in Boston in that era. I thought about she didn't know her mother and she'd had this terrible upbringing, what that would have felt like, and then conversations with directors and just digging, basically. How do you find that that digging helps you when you get in front of the camera? Do you find that it just sort of creates honest instincts or do you find that you're actually pulling from what you dug up in the moment? I think that having a, just an understanding of who you're playing is just, it's just useful. You just go in with a confidence that you know who you are. And then if someone throws something at you, there's a moment where you could improvise. You, you know, you're not reacting as yourself, but you're reacting from a place that's truthful to who you're portraying, basically. Next question. Hi, Sienna. Hi. Lovely to see you. Do you have a particular kind of role as a woman that you like to play? I mean, are you drawn more to strong women or what, what's your favorite portrayal i mean i'd say on the whole i'm probably more drawn to the people that i'd find most interesting to look at walking down the street so anyone who's like a little bit nuts or <laughs> on the fringe of society or destructive or damaged i mean i just that's those are the people that i i do find interesting to look at and therefore to research i've also played a lot of real people i love i exploring real characters i played tippy hedron and edie cedric and Nancy Schultz and like all sorts of, of real people but um playing just just someone kind of sweet and with nothing going on I think I get pretty bored I'd always try to find some psychological problem that I can like play with <laughs> do you ever have a role that's just a sweet person and you're trying to throw a psychological she problem can't be all because no yeah she's definitely been uh, yeah I don't know. Like, no no she's very well she's organized she's fine like, no, 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 no I she's think she's not. crazy <laughs> yeah, exactly uh, I think we have time for one more question right here. 
Hi, Sienna. Hi. Um, so I got to see you as Sally in Cabaret on Broadway. And I also saw Emma and Michelle do it as well, but I really loved your performance. Um, so I was just wondering, is musical theater something you want to continue doing? <laughs> The great thing about playing Sally Bowles is that she doesn't have to be a great singer and dancer, and I am not. I mean, I'm wildly enthusiastic, but not. I'm not vocally trained. So I would love to do another musical, but I don't know that I have the training to sustain like a proper one. I actually, I'd love to do cabaret again one day and I want to be the MC. I want to be a female MC in cabaret. And if I could just, um, <laughs> if I could just, play Sally Bowles for the rest of my life in that production with Alan Cumming, I would. I feel like I creatively peaked there. I don't know where I go from there because it was the most thrilling experience of my life. Sienna, I have to let you go. Uh, Live by Night, when does it come out? It comes out limited theaters on Christmas Day and wide, <laughs> <laughs> like robot voice, wide on January 13th. And it's amazing. I mean, go see it, please. He does a wonderful job directing it and you do a fantastic job in the film. Sienna Miller, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Sienna. Thank you.